Alright guys, welcome. Wait, uh, this, this debate today will be about the future of nuclear power. Um, we have a whole panel here for you we will be discussing the subject. And also today we have Dorsey who will be moderating. Uh, I would like to just open up with a question. Uh, maybe you don't know, maybe you just undecided, but who of you can say that you're pro-nuclear power? Raise your hands. You don't have to if you don't want to, just to see. And uh, work who's against nuclear power? Hmm. Well, a bit more against maybe, but probably. Right, I'll give you the first one. Right. Thank you, Matthias. Uh, my name is Darcy, and I'll be your moderator for tonight. Um, the way the night will work is we have about an hour to uh, for the debaters to discuss this question of uh, the future of nuclear power. Uh, and then we'll aim to have about half an hour at the end for the audience to ask questions. So if you have some questions, uh, we'll save them till then, but hopefully we'll get a chance for everyone to, uh, to ask the questions that they have. So we have five guests with us tonight. We have uh, first starting from my left, Samuel Biss, who designs nuclear reactors at UC Berkeley and has a patent for security systems for nuclear power. Beside him, Gunn Carlson, former president of the Swedish Radiation Safety, Safety Authority. So he's a professor in the new capacity challenge in the 70s, but I was chairman of the Reactor Safety Committee at the Inspectorate of the Authority. And we have Anita Janberg from Folkpartia. Isadora Bronski, um, who is responsible for climate and energy issues at Greenpeace Sweden. And Lorenz Tobat from So what we'll do to start off with is uh, we'll give everyone two minutes to uh, put forward their position on uh, nuclear power. And uh, we'll start with Safa. Okay, can I just start by asking, is there anyone in here that hasn't made up their mind yet? That's just kind of trying to make it up. Okay, there's two people. So we'll be aiming for you two. Uh, so hopefully maybe we can uh, convert someone. Uh, so I think uh, all of us up here kind of fundamentally want the same thing. We don't fundamentally want anything different. We want you know, clean, reliable, uh, safe energy uh, for the world. And I think where we differ is just how we realistically think we can achieve this in the short term. But we have a, a very big problem to solve. And what we see in the world is when you dismantle nuclear power, emissions go up, pollution go up. Uh, this is because nuclear power is an emissions-free energy source, the only baseload emissions-free energy source that we can expand on right now. Almost all of the emissions-free energy in the world right now come from hydropower and nuclear power. There's a modest contribution by wind and solar, when the wind is blowing, or if the sun is shining. And that's, that's great, and we should expand that too. Germany is a, is a prime example of how this works. They said they would shut down nuclear power. They're building 23 new major coal power stations uh, to replace this power. Uh, emissions will increase by a million tons of carbon dioxide or more per plant that they are replacing. Uh, so what we come to is the worst thing you can do for and the environment right now is, is to argue that we should shut down nuclear power. The best thing we can do to try to replace fossil fuels is to try to increase the power from nuclear power and also obviously aim for an increased production of solar and wind. And together these three uh, energy sources could potentially uh, replace a lot of the fossil fuels that we do need to replace. So that's we will elaborate a lot more, but that's the, the basic thesis. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yes, it's uh, almost it's, uh, similar to what you have done. I think also this climate challenge is much worse. So even if we have to accept them and some uh, format down expense, we have to accept it because the climate zones are uh, shifting north towards one meter an hour. I'm very anxious about the, the climate uh, problem we are facing right now. Uh, but uh, I am also critical to, to some extent, but because it's the reliability of the Swedish nuclear power stations are more or less worse in the world, so we have to have the, the competence to, to, to operate the nuclear reactors uh, in a much better way. You know, 
learn from Patinkis that the political party that says that we had to have the nuclear uh, resources and at the same time we have to have uh, uh, the renewable sources too. But parallel, they have to work together because we can't have any more uh, pollution from the coal. And that is the, the cry for the future for our children. And we have to show from the political side uh, what the will are. And our will is to get the uh, uh, to get the power to the people who is working with the nuclear power and make it safe for the society. So the industry know for many, many years that we have energy power in our land and we can have oil work and we can have energy for our society. Okay, um, well, me and the rest of the environmental movement who have been talking about climate change for the last at least 20 years, uh, we think that nuclear power is not a climate solution because we need to replace about 80% fossil fuel in the world and today nuclear comprises of about 6% of the primary energy in the world and that's primarily including uh, losses and um, it takes about 10 to 15 years to build the reactor unless you're going to do it in the, in the way they do it in Southeast Asia today if you want to do it in a like, safe way or what we consider safe in, in the Western world that's the time frame we're looking at. And it's impossible to meet what the I, International Energy Agency say we need to do, which is start to decrease emissions from 2017, uh, the trend of increasing emissions, by replacing fossil fuels with um, nuclear power. What we need to do is instead put in very strong energy efficiency measures, which the International Energy Agency is, is speaking about as well, and replace fossil fuel with uh, renewable capacity. And what we see happening in the world today, and the, the example of, of Germany that you took is a very good example, because if you look at the statistics, what has happened after they took away eight reactors, the start of the energy vendor, is that their emissions has actually decreased. So to take away, you said emission free, that's not correct. It has some emissions, although they're la very low, but that's not the main ar argument. Uh, but say carbon neutral, take, take away carbon neutral uh, nuclear energy has led to decreased emissions because you, you see the boom in um, renewable capacity and Germany is now really making a huge effort to make energy efficiency measures. But also from another perspective, the, the price, estimated price of a new nuclear reactor, that's not us, that's Iliad, their price projections is 8.6 billion euros for a new reactor. We've seen one consortium after the other uh, fall apart in the UK who said that they were going to go for uh, uh, nukes as the low carbon option. And we just see that it's not economically viable. It's not going to happen in time and there's no value as the money for it. When it comes to Sweden... I think I'll, I'll okay. I'll be for a yes. We'll get back into that. I want to give everyone a chance to... Uh, Alright. To begin with, thank you for having this uh, interesting debate and this very important issue. Uh, I'm going to argue that nuclear power is more or less uh, totally pointless today. It is not efficient at all, and it is uh, far too much uh, expensive. Uh, and well, I'll just meet this, this question about the climate crisis. Uh, the climate crisis is, is global, and that means that we have to reduce emissions uh, mostly in the, in the rich countries, because we, have, we uh, emit more in the rich countries. Uh, and we use much more uh, energy in the rich countries, uh, which means that uh, if, we, if we have to address this, this um, climate crisis, then we have to reduce our energy use. Uh, and if you compare to the, to the poor part of the world, then you don't use much energy at all. Energy at all. So what we have to do is start uh, the energy revolution in, in the poor countries with funding from, from Western countries, from rich countries. Uh, and we can uh, parallel with that save much energy in, in the rich countries. Uh, so, yeah, uh, I'll stop there. So it's 
it's uh, I find the, the argumentation quite confusing. It's obvious that we all want the same thing. I feel like that's the first thing I said. It's obvious that we all want the same thing. I, I do not understand, and I will never understand the argument of building nuclear power plants will not reduce emissions. It is, as you said, carbon neutral is just a tiny bit of emissions in the life cycle. If you build a nuclear power station that replaces a coal power station, there's, there's no way to argue that there wouldn't be a massive decrease of emissions. There's in time. Well, I mean, you will have to build a lot of windmills. Yes. A lot of windmills. That will take a lot of time. A lot of solar cells will have to be built. And I argue that we should do this. There, the, the, the amount of energy we have to replace is enormous. It's unfathomable. We time should do all of it. I, I don't argue against what you're saying. I just argue that you are missing one of the vital components that might make it possible to do this. I'm saying might, but still an enormous challenge. Our, our energy demand in the world, in 50 years, will probably grow three to six times. And most of this is for fossil fuels. Fossil fuels will run out. We need to replace this somehow. We shouldn't just throw away one of our, well, the biggest option we have today, the biggest emission-free energy source, apart from hydropower that we have. We can't throw that away. If you, if you shut down all these plants, it has, that also has to be replaced. So that's, that's my comment on that. Also, you, you're saying uh, reactors cost 9 billion euros. Well, the finished one might. There are plenty of reactors being built across the world that are on time and on budget. Uh, I was just in UAE, the United Arab Emirates. They're building a giant solar park there. Uh, it's financially doesn't really make sense to them, so they decided to build 40 nuclear reactors. They're going to cost, on a fixed price, about 20 billion Swedish crowns each. So it's about 40, what you said. So it depends on who you buy the reactor from, what kind of deal you're making, and if you're a smart businessman or not. So yes, you can use the highest number in the world, or you can you know, try to be honest about it. Thank you, Bjorn. As a, the Swedish reactors are spending about 60 billion million ton carbon dioxide every year. And it's almost the same as we had in all the emissions of in Sweden, all the chimneys, local chimneys in Sweden, and also the exhaust from, from uh, so in, we could more or less be neutral if we are keeping the, the nuclear, or we are instead of facing out to export uh, electricity and replace uh, coal collapsing plants with about efficiency of 30%. And what we also have to face is, is from a competitive point of view, that the operating cost is about three euro, Swedish euro per kilowatt hour. One euro for the uranium, one euro for, for, for enrichment, and one euro for fabrication of the fuel, nuclear fuel. So you have to, to compete with, with, with such figures, uh, including looking on existing uh, power stations. But of course, the new ones are very, very expensive from, from an investment point of view. But for example, we can't just look from uh, the energy. We have to look for every resources. And for example, to build a wind power station takes about 50 times more material than a nuclear plant. And uh, so, if, if we are taking into account other resources like labor, material, capital, uh, environment, and so on, it's, it's, it's also. Uh, all right so um, um Bjorn was talking about uh, keeping the swedish nuclear, nuclear reactors and um, actually last week um, the international energy uh, agency was in stockholm at the seminar uh, and they said for the first time they said that sweden you have to uh, build new nuclear or close all the nuclear reactors by the time of uh, 2030. So that's not an option actually, because they are too old and too, too dysfunctional. Uh, and talking about uh, the climate crisis, uh, still it takes too long time, and uh, still it's not efficient, and still it's too, too exp uh, expensive to build nuclear. Uh, just take this uh, uh, reactor in Olkluoto uh, in, in Finland, for example. It was supposed to be the new flagship of all the nuclear reactors in the world. Uh, and today, uh, we got the message that it's, it's going to be 
um, uh, delayed the start of the reactor. It's going to de be delayed two more years, and it's already four years delayed. And the price, uh, the cost has doubled during the, this, this, uh, this time. So it's still, it's still uh, it doesn't make sense to, to stop the climate crisis by, by uh, inefficient uh, technologies. Uh, instead, we should actually just put all our, our energy uh, in, in um, renewables, and that's, that's really possible. Uh, Germany is the perfect example here. They, they have a price guarantee system, system that, that makes you, as an invest, investor, um, sure that you can invest and then get the price you cost, so to speak. The, the price is going to replace the cost. Also. And that's, that's really working in Germany and we should, we should expand that system so that it's also in Sweden and also globally as possible. Okay, first of all some facts on the coal emissions in Germany. First of all, no decision to open up a nuclear uh, coal power plant has been taken since the decision to phase out nuclear. That was all, that was all old decisions taken long before the phase-out decision. And, for instance, by Vattenfall, who is now finishing off and has opened Bobsberg and Moldberg. But no decision since then. And in EU, we have climate legislation, which, which put a roof to how much we can emit. And Peter Altmaier, I was in Berlin this autumn, is very clear about the fact that they're going to meet their reduction target of 40% to 2020, and it's going to be domestic. It's not going to be that other countries like our climate target in Sweden. So, to say that coal power is going to increase, no, it's not going to increase. Then, the second thing, the question is not, I'm not saying, I'm not saying that the cost of nuclear is any particular price. This is estimation from, from uh, the industry itself. This is EDF that now goes out and is blackmailing the, the, the UK government, not blackmailing, but saying officially in the in, uh, uh, media that unless you give us subsidies, or green guarantees we're not going to build anymore because everybody else has left the consortium. Horizon, everybody withdraw, Eon withdraw, all of those uh, companies withdraw. Centrica was the last one to pull out now, and that's the only one who's left is is um, EDF who's standing there. And yes, sure, you can build small reactors with completely different safety standards you know, in countries who are willing to do that. But I'm just saying, in Europe, nuclear power is dead. It's not going to happen. It's, it's, there's no renaissance, hasn't been any. The, the only two construction sites in Europe is Oikilote 3 and Flammaville in France. Both of them delayed. Now Oikilote 3 until 2016. It has taken 11 years. The, the cost is more than doubled. Nobody knows when it's going to be finished. It's, it, there's a risk that this is going to be the biggest uh, construction um, uh, breakdown uh, in, that we have in Europe. And also TVU and Aria is now fighting who's going to take the cost for this. In the end, it's going to be the consumers. So I'm just saying from a market point of view, there's not going to be any reactors. The big question is how long can we live with the reactors we have? They are very old. Sweden's oldest reactor will be 41 years this year. And uh, the two oldest that exist in the world is 43 years old. So the question is what kind of risks are we willing to live with? And, and also, if we want to secure 400,000 jobs within the uh, electricity intensive industry, then we need to me, uh, make sure that they can secure security of supply, we, that we have electricity that meets that. And nuclear, with nuclear we don't, we don't have that today. Oskarshamn was down, Obertan was down the entire year last year, what, except for one week. This is not acceptable. This is not security of supply. We need to, to and it takes two, two, about two years to build a wind farm. So, no problem. And also material-wise, no problem. People have looked at that. Well, I need a chime in, but then I'm going to come up with Yes, a little bit, because uh, the wind power, uh, and I have been struggling my mind, because we're talking about wind power as it was the big solution. And I really want to have the wind power. But people who's living next to, to the wind power station don't like it. So I, I think uh, they had the shadows from this wind. We don't know how it uh, will uh, what do to our head. The sound from, from this big station also are there. I have never been there. I have been only reading about it. But still, I am a politician. And people are calling me and said, please, Anita, there is not a 
easy solution to be uh, to build this big uh, wind craft power. And we have to do something. And I think to develop nuclear power is one of the things that we have to do until we have developed the renewable resources at all. So I'd like to ask a question to the, uh, the nuclear power group here. Because um, there's been, uh, people have mentioned that it's been a long time since nuclear power plants have been built in Europe and that the, the current ones have had difficulties being constructed. And perhaps they've been built in other countries, but um, why haven't they been built in Europe? What's, uh, what are the, um, what's stopping nuclear power plants? What's been stopping them? And how is that possible to change in the future? Uh, surveillance uh, 
the second team soon. And uh, we have, in average, one incident a day in Swedish nuclear power plants. So the question is, how long can we go on with this? Oscar Schaum, just before Christmas, what the 20th of, uh, of uh, December, uh, the, the regulator, uh, Strosa case Mugeta, gave them another uh, two years to fix safety issues. They already had six, ta six years where they didn't fix them. So now an expansion of eight years in total. The day after they go out to say, oh, and now we need to put the entire nuclear power plant under special uh, uh, supervision. So we have, we have quite an emerging, urgent situation in Sweden with very insecure reactors. And the same thing goes for other few countries in Europe. And it's also a lot of other countries like Switzerland, Belgium, uh, Italy, who's, who's definitely chosen uh, a way nuclear power, who said, no, we're going to decommission, we're not going to have this at all. I'll just, I'll, just add, I'll just add that uh, the, the Swedish nuclear, nuclear power plants uh, are also the, the most dangerous ones in, in the EU according to EU's uh, stress tests. So, so the situation in Sweden is really bad. The reliability of the Swedish threats are unacceptable right now. And it does all depend on, on, on the incompetence. It's also a question of the economy because they are earning more money. by the World Health Organization, they only took into account reports in English. So no reports in Russian whatsoever in this former area was taken into account at all. So ours and many others with ours estimations is way higher. It's like hundreds of thousands. 
when it comes to costs the, and the suffering, where you create a no-go area for all foreseeable time, that's a completely different thing. In Fukushima, I've met many people who were affected. What happened to them is like they, their family was split because some their parents needed to stay and work. They can't leave their work while they're sending off the kids to other parts of uh, relatives in other parts of the country because they don't want them to be there and be exposed to radiation levels. It took about one and a half month until the authorities came out and said we have a meltdown. Although they knew after four or for one reactor and 16 for another reactor that they had meltdowns. They didn't inform people. People were out looking for water when most of the fall down happened. And the long term consequences of this we don't know yet. There's been some reporting in local uh, media about increased thyroid cancer in children even now. Not confirmed though. But that's that's the current status, but we can't, what we know is that we have a huge zone that for all foreseeable time will be a no-go. The, the economical loss of this is enormous. The, the estimations of what this will cost to the, to the Japanese society is between 500 and 650 million dollars. And if you look at what the nuclear companies was, were insured for, what, what kind of insurance uh, TEPCO had, that's not at all in line with that. Also the compensation to the people, what they got after losing everything, having to be put in uh, 100,000 people sitting in evacuation uh, uh, houses. It was nothing. And they lost everything. They can't work anymore. It's a huge catastrophe to the entire society. So to talk about coconuts is a bit disrespectful to all those people who are suffering and who know that the kids might die from cancer one day. Okay. There, there was a massive uh, natural disaster that struck Japan and 29,000 people died. Obviously, it's, it's a massive destruction in the country. A lot of people lost their homes. Down, well, 29,000 people died. due to nuclear. Yeah, so there was a na massive natural disaster. Obviously, there are terrible things happening. And yeah, nuclear power plants failed. No one died as a consequence of it. It, it speaks volumes to where we're at. Obviously, there's a lot of bad consequences when, when a one-in-a-thousand-year wave hits a, the coast of a nation and kills a lot of people and destroys the infrastructure, yes, and, and there are consequences for the nuclear plants as well. That's obvious. No one's denying that. That's what you have to the, uh, we're talking about, not from the sorry, tsunami. Sorry, I'll let stop as an issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that, that's all I was, I was going to, trying to put this in perspective, because uh, a lot of people think millions of people around the world have died in nuclear accidents, and it's just not true. There are thousands and thousands of serious scientists looking at this in Russia, obviously. We have tight connections in the nuclear uh, research industry. Everyone's looking everywhere. Everyone's doing research and we come up with, so this is the UN and World Health Organization have come up with very serious reports about this. this, this, this these numbers are estimates that are, no one really believes. They're high estimates of a statistical increase in cancer. So if you have X percent risk of getting cancer in your life, you have X plus 0.001% chance of getting cancer in your life now. And if you expand that over a few million people, you get a few thousand deaths, possibly. Now that's the high number. So if you use the high number, it is equivalent to coconut deaths. And that's what I think is not, you know, publicly. I'm sorry, I'd like to, I know there's a lot of debate about what has happened and the, the different accident issues. Uh, but for the time we have left, I'd like to talk about the future. It's kind of, there's a focus here. Uh, so I'd like to hear what the, for example, what's the potential for future nuclear power in Sweden um, or in other European countries, given that there have been, say, security issues and things like that. Does anyone take a stab at that or should we let? Mm -hmm. No, go ahead. Well, uh, we're talking to uh, Mats Lagerborn at Tottenfall, who is the guy in, in charge of looking into this, and uh, who has around uh, 30 people under him, or that's what they say. Uh, looking at the numbers for this. And of course, it's um, for them, uh, when they close the current reactor, that's a matter of uh, calculation of how much more money they want to pump into security or how much delays they can get from SSM. So, and as I said, since 10 out of 14 inspectors of SSM come straight from the industry, they of course get a lot of delays. But regardless of that, that's a, there, there is a breaching point where they can't continue to invest. And what he's saying is that they won't take any, and this is out in Swedish media as well, we won't take any investment decision in the next 10 years. So not until 2022, you will have an investment decision. 
then it takes about 10 to 15 years to build the reactor, according to the latest standard. He al he's also saying that if we want to build in Sweden, we don't want to build according to the standards we have today, we want to you know, have the highest available security technique. So, which means a long time is actually. And that, that would mean that while we're starting to take off reactors offline, somewhere between now and, I mean, who knows if Oscar Chan won, will ever come online again. It, it, it's for sure that it, it has a reduced uh, capacity uh, with 25%, for sure. That's the uh, Siemens who's saying that the turbine, turbine won't produce any more than that. It's like they were, were, won't be able to handle a higher capacity than that. Um, so I would say, no, it's not gonna happen. There's also, the, the Swedish government has also stated that they won't subsidize any uh, give any subsidi subsidies to new nuclear power. That was in the agreement when they opened up for it. And it's just impossible with the current costs of 8.6. It's, it's cheaper with offshore wind power than new nuclear. Who's going to build new nuclear? No one. Is there, a, is there potential for Sweden or other developed countries? A, uh, well, a lot of countries uh, around the world where the most of the energy demand will be coming from are obviously uh, going very hard for nuclear. Sweden is more unclear. I mean, we are one of the countries in the world that probably has the financial possibility of, of trying to do something else. It's going to be very, very hard on our grid to try to make uh, half of our energy supply uh, intermittent. So if the wind blows or if the sun shines. Uh, you can space, I have done a lot of research. I am a very big proponent of wind power. I used to do research on wind power. Uh, so I, I, I'm all for wind power. And you can place it all around the country and get a kind of an even, more or less even, Distribution, but it's very, very tough on the electricity grid to have half of its energy come from intermittent sources. So I, I really think that we are going to build a new power. And the, the, the transfer of wind power in Sweden is still less than one unit of transfer. No. Today, if no. we have 2.7.2 the terawatt hour produced last year from wind. Uh, we have to, 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 uh, it's a question of energy rather than the, the, the demand. So if you look for the, the total amount of energy for production is less than the budget. Including losses then? But I think the, the, the climate is, there is a serious problem, much more. And in, in the future, of course, nuclear isn't the, the, the only solution. We have to have a mix, everything more or less. And from the efficiency point of view, there's a lot of things to do. For example, the resistant heaters in houses are quite ridiculous. It's more or less a shortage of electricity. Yeah, I just, uh, there's one <coughs> big thing here that we don't discuss, and that is energy efficiency. We have yeah, mentioned it as so well. Actually, in Sweden right now, we are heading towards a, a, a situation where we have too much energy, actually. So, quite many say that, many reports and so on say that we can, we can actually save 30% of our energy to, to 2030. And then there's just like 10 or like 10, 15% uh, nuclear actually left. And that is of course possible to, to build so much uh, renewable energy. Um, the, the former um, GD in, in uh, Energimyndigheten, the Minister of uh, Energy. Energy and Agency in Sweden, he said just weeks ago that there's fully possible to, to go to 100% renewable uh, in, in 19, no, no, 2030. So like we, we have all the possibilities in the world in Sweden, and, and it's just, it's just a, a question of political will, actually. And um, yeah. If, uh, if we accept that, mm -hmm. it's also possible to say another 60 million tons by keeping the, the new in Sweden. It talks. Or at least what do you mean? Like, no, I think uh, I think the the, 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 problem, the climate problems is more serious. Whatever carbon-free production we have of, uh, of energy in Sweden, we replace something somewhere. The European grids are connected. So if we are overproducing clean energy, that is a good thing. That's not that we should stop doing that. Obviously, we should overproduce clean energy from emissions-free sources like nuclear, wind, and solar. If we can, then replace dirty stuff elsewhere in Europe. So but then, as Isabella said, we have the, the, the 
emission trading market in, in the EU. So, like, if we really can uh, can uh, go to, to totally 100% uh, renewable, uh, then we have like uh, you you not you, you won't be able in other countries in the EU to to decrease in the emissions too much. So, yeah. And it would be great for us to be able to provide emissions free energy to them that that will make perfect sense. Is it right that you want to comment? Yeah, sure. But what is happening today is that not that Sweden is going in advance. We have that technical, theoretical potential of doing it. The industry is willing to do it. Everybody thinks it's possible. And they're coming up also up to this Renewable Energy Council to come up with a report in March stating how you're going to do it. And Professor Zetko, the KTH, has, has proven that. that for at, uh, we can regulate about 40 terawatt hours of wind and 10 terawatt hours of uh, solar production each year. That's Lennart Schaller, a recent report. So that's not going to be a problem also, just with our own uh, hydropower. And then we're not even talking about such things as storage, increased grid capacity, and demand side management, which will also come. We're looking at smart grids in the future, smart energy systems, etc. So. That's, that will come, and I think it's very important to keep in mind that we're looking at also at a pan-European uh, system. It's not only for about a uh, question for Sweden to be able to provide, be self-sufficient. We're part of Europe. We're part of it's a global it's global prob problems we're facing, and it's Europeans' actions we're doing. And first of all, if we want to get rid of the coal power in the EU, what we need to do is to fix the price of the ETS, which is now you know at the same cost as of a, a beer. What, to emit one ton of uh, carbon dioxide, it's about four euros or something. It's that's not doesn't make sense. So, but that that's happening also to some extent, or will happen. So, if we take care of that, that will keep away the coal expansion, and that's not going to happen. EU has committed to reduce its emission by eighty to ninety five percent to twenty fifty. That's agreed. And also, we're looking at a scenario where. This autumn, IPCC will come up with, uh, out with their next series of, of reports, and they're actually going to launch the first report, which is the most scary one, which talks about all the, the state the planet, planet is in. That's going to be uh, launched in, in Stockholm. So we're, we will have a huge climate debate again, and we will have a call for action, and people will want to act, and the industry will have to power shift, etc. But we have, we in Sweden, with our potentials, need to go, go for renewable energy so that we can, for instance, you know, replace uh, big industrial processes with uh, biogas, for instance, in the distant future, etc. Which is, or, uh, which as well, obviously, we need, etc. So, yeah. Sure. Yes, if we become a functioning free market in Europe, we have to, to, to invest in much more uh, by uh, combined heat and power plants, power plants, uh, uh, much more than, than other countries because we have a domestic heating system everywhere, more or less. But uh, the most serious problem is we, from the energy point of view, that we are using three times as much uh, electricity uh, per unit for everything, more or less. And, and, uh, Therefore, we have to produce more uh, carbon dioxide for free uh, power, but we have to reduce the, 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 amount of, uh, the consumption of, of electricity. And therefore, we should export a lot of electricity, and we have to look at more, more power as ordinary industrial products. Uh, and, and we could be a big part of the solution, at least for both. If we accept what you are saying about the universe, we could still use the, the, the nuclear and then use the modern amount of carbon dioxide. But then, at, at, at least for, for 50 years. But then again, no one wants to live because it's too expensive. Can you say so? Yeah. Not power plant, power plant. The power companies say so. That's why they're going up. That's why Eon is not investing in Pleo because they plan to. They were going to build more reactors in Finland. That's not happening. They're withdrawing. They're saying Eon had 34% shares in that uh, consortium or conglomerate or whatever. And they withdraw. 
It's like nobody wants to invest in this. They are saying that the uh, Tyson, their, their executive CEO, he's saying the, the future is in uh, energy efficiency and renewables. They're looking at shifting their business models, providing energy services. They still, of course, want to keep their old plants that they are they're paid off a long time ago, with which they can very cheaply produce electricity and sell expensively if you play around a little bit with them. And so, of course, they don't want to close them down. That's why you need to talk about this imaginary future and potential renaissance of the nuclear power to, to hold uh, the market for the current ones still in operation, nothing else. That's fooling people, keeping them behind the door. It's also the big emitters, which is all like uh, the US and China, who's really going into renewable energy as well because they have an and and policy. They're investing in everything just to meet their high energy demands. So China just this week said that, that no, they're going to increase their goal uh, for 2015 when it comes to solar PV from 21 to 35 gigawatts. So, okay, compared to nuclear, not much still, but it's happening at a speed that is very, very high. And in just a few years... Yes, exactly. So, I mean, China is not a good example at all, but it will, it will push down the the global uh, prices of PV and, and uh, increase the energy for other countries. I mean, unfortunately, we have an economical crisis in the in the EU at the moment, and people are so. In, and in Sweden, we have very low electricity price and low certificates price, which means that nobody at the moment is investing in the renewables as they should. But and no no goals, no 100% goal in the future as an, an incentive. How many square meters do we have? In Sweden. You. I have a, a laptop charger. I think the square meters. Oh, right. Okay. Uh, since uh, we have about 10 minutes left before we take any questions, and I was thinking since we're with the, the Foreign Affairs Society here, I'd like to hear what people think about the potential for nuclear in other countries, so like outside of Europe, um, where there, there is some growth in the nuclear industry. Is there, uh, is there more potential in the future? Is it, will it keep going? Uh, I don't see the potential, um, uh, and of course uh, we cannot just tell other countries to phase out all the nuclear power like like that. But in the future, I think like the, the trend that that goes to renewable is going to be actually global. And Naturskyddsföreningen um, looked at this this question of, of actually getting all the poor countries to to invest more in. Uh, Renewables. Uh, UN has 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 um, compared how much energy you use uh, and your life standard, uh, and you can see that if you use a very very little uh, energy, then it's quite bad life standard. And then it goes like this: uh, more the more you use, the better, and then it becomes flat after that. So, for example, the US and Sweden, we use so much energy that it doesn't doesn't make sense actually. We we don't need more. Energy. But uh, poor countries need more energy, and that's why they they propose uh, this uh, price um, price guarantee system, where you through the UN Climate Fund you pay money, uh, rich countries pay money, and then uh, and then you 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 get guarantees for your investments in renewable energy in poor countries, and this system is going to work according to the Australia, and and those kind of solutions. Uh, External costs, for example, in the EU, eastern part of Europe, is about four Swedish cars per kilowatt hour. And that's huge. And, and of course, we can't solve the problems without taking into account also the external costs for the environment and maintenance. Uh, but we have also, also the
concerned about the environment, but that's usually when people go into this because they try to save the environment. If you're looking at the big uh, energy users of the future, which is China and India, they have very, very active, very, very large nuclear power programs. And they're looking obviously to replace their base flow power with something better. So the base flow is something that's on all the time uh, that you run industry on. And they have to replace their base flow power with something else that runs all the time. The best thing to do usually is hydropower. So you put a big dam and you put hydro turbines. And this is, has a much worse safety record than, than nuclear, but it's more liked because uh, people are less afraid of it because it's easier to understand. Uh, so they're doing that as much as they can, but obviously they're also very, very uh, much uh, going for nuclear power in, in China. And, India. and that, they will be the bigger energy users of the international traps is about eight hundred new reactors in the world. So uh, I think we should have a mixture of everything to solve the problem. Well, uh, and I don't think uh, they will become reality. And the few that does will not have the same uh, safety requirements, and then we'll have to also face those consequences. Max Planck's Institute made new calculations according to. Uh, the, the frequency of, of huge catastrophes that we've seen, which, and their estimation is that we'll now see uh, seven, uh, a number seven in the in a scale uh, accident, one every ten years. That's their their estimations of it. If you look at the probability for a nuclear accident, but the but people don't want nuclear. Then also, as I started to say initially, eighty percent of of fossil fuels needs to be replaced. 10 to 15 years to build the reactor, emissions need to peak at 2017 and then go down. How are you going to do that with, with building new nuclear power? That's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Well, we build these the existing ones. Well, the existing ones, I think we need to shut them down out of a safety perspective. But from a climate perspective, we cannot build new ones. It's worse if we are facing out the existing power plants. Well, they have to, many of them have to be phased out regardless because they're old. It's like the Swedish ones. And, and For example, the Oskarshamn F is a better, better, much better shape today than when it started in 1970. It's at seven percent, seventy-five percent of. Uh, well, you have you have replaced a lot of things, but it it can't run more than seventy-five percent, and that's because they have a turbine shaking. The, uh, yes, the, the, the turbine the, that they can't. Yeah, but, but no, they have done so, but they can't get rid of the little shake that is there. And Siemens says, no, we can't, we can't deliver any other solution for you, I'm sorry. Uh, but it takes about two years' time to build windmills, so uh, PV even less than that. So the fast track to saving the climate and energy efficiency, f fastest, I don't know what. The fast track to saving climate is, of course, to take those viable solutions instead of do, doing lock-in effects of huge investments that might end up being stranded investments like the one in Oikoloto 3 to an unsafe future with where you don't, don't where you also have to take into account are, how are you going to get the uranium for all those reactors? They, it's but according to according to. Okay, it depends on how easily, easily available. If you look at the International Energy IAEA's uh, account for easily accessible uranium, they talk about eight years. For yes. the current reactors, about 400 because years. Because we know that it's not of the uranium. We don't have to see for it for more than eight years. So that's a uranium, is, uranium is a negligible cost in, in well, the uh, uh, yeah, but that's quite there's no there's no incentive to go and look for more uranium. All of all of the ocean seawater has a, a uranium extractable. Uh, if you triple the cost of uranium right now, you can extract uranium from seawater. There's something like 4.5 billion tons. That is if we're using like the, the reactor types that we are using today. If we're going transcending to generation four reactors, this is a non-issue. We have just our the uranium that we dug up right now is enough for millennia. Talk about generation four since 1950 still hasn't happened. I think we'll. Uh, agree we should, we should just testing. We'll just stop this part of the debate for now, um, so that we can have the chance to take questions. So, if anyone has questions, you're welcome to ask them to the group or um, to specific people, and then we'll have a little debate after every question too. So, uh, I have a question for both sides of the debate. Uh, wind power has been 
very, very expensive. And solar power has been extremely expensive. And those kind of power has had a kind of modest technology development, a large development in fabrication processes, and obtained large volumes with mass production. And uh, why should not nuclear power have, have a modest technology development? Not the other generation four, second generation three, and uh, be mass produced like uh, container ships or airliners. Should that not solve the problem with nuclear power taking a long time to ramp up and being too expensive? Yeah, anyone who wants to keep your answers fairly short so that we can. Yes. Explain. Okay. Well, yeah. <laughs> since, okay, even if you try to do this, which I don't think people will go with, which I don't think the MS point, I mean, it's, it's not, a, I mean, it's a theoretical idea, right? So I don't think that's going to happen. What, what's happening is we have a climate threat that we need to meet, and we have existing mature technology that can meet that demand, that very fast to replace coal power and other things. And of course, the best thing is, of course, efficiency, which also the International Energy Agency says, because that's the cheapest thing. That will also mean co more increased competition for the Swedish industry if they become more efficient. I mean, today you have industry in China that is more efficient than the Swedish so one. If nuclear power were cheap, then you would propose building more of it since it could be a large part of the solution for the major problem. Well, I see other problems with nuclear power and that's from that point of view. But I also see that the prices for PV and wind has is rapidly decreasing. It has shifted it has the just the fact that Germany came into that battle has really changed the market. I don't know where it's down to right now, but we're also talking about technologies that were supposed to compete with so heavily subsidized other old techniques. So you had to subsidize them. Yeah, I, I think you're on the exactly right track uh, when you're thinking. So there are plenty of commercial small modular reactors that are being marketed by nuclear reactor vendors. Russia is right now building a small electrical reactor, which is a generation four reactor. And they're planning to build plenty of them. In the US, Westinghouse is a small modular reactor commercially designed, ready to buy. Uh, BMW has Empower, which has the support of the US Department of Energy, and they're getting millions to, to license that and build that as well. And these are small rail transportable reactors that could do exactly what you're saying. Obviously, just like the old little plants, you have to build the first one first, and then the first of a kind. That always costs a little bit more. And then once you get it rolling, you get you know mass production. And that would be much better if you have a modular design like that. So I think you're on the right track, and I think that would be a large part of how we will solve the climate crisis. But of course, it's a problem that the existing reactors were designed in the 50s or 60s, and it's the first yet generation. Then we haven't practiced the third generation or the fourth generation, only by scientific uh, laboratories. Well, there have been a, a number of generation four years already. There is one already in Russia right now. It's, it's not a futuristic technology. There, there has been two in France. There's one That's in right. Russia right now operating. There's one in India. There's one in China. And they're building more. So it's not a futuristic 30 years ahead. They're, they haven't built, they haven't operated, we know how they run, so, so it's, you know, it's not, there's one commercial design right now outside of Russia, but it's not, it's not something from far down the line. I think the uh, next question is right yes. inside. So, well, energy is also a matter of national security, that we should always provide energy for the people. And I believe too that renewable energy is a good solution in the future and should start now. But how do you plan to the green side to transform the energy sector from going to from nuclear to the green one? Well, or from coal to the green one? Well, okay, we'll let the uh, Lord come first. Uh, there's, there's a lot of uh, marketers actually that, that says that it's, it's really possible, it's quite, quite in, in the near future to, to trans transform the, the energy market. Uh, and one of the, I've been, I've been talking about that a lot, but this price guarantee system that we have in Germany, for example, and in a lot of other places as well, that an investment, you could be just one person actually that invests in solar panels or in, 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 in green energy, then you get the, the price uh, guaranteed from the, from the government, so to speak, and then 
it, it works really good in Germany. Um, and also, uh, energy saving, uh, houses and uh, a lot of things. Yeah, but the question I have is like, the renewables right now are like intermittent uh, like the resources, but how do you guarantee the constant supply of energy? Oh, okay. Yes, it's a yes. yeah. curiosity to buy. That's what I, what I was referring to before with the, the report from Lena Schade, called the age. You can download it from, and uh, which shows that with our current hydropower, we can regulate 40 terawatt hours of wind and 10 of solar. Today, we, last year, we produced 7.2 7 terawatt hours of wind in Sweden. That made up 5% of the Swedish electricity. Nuclear made up about 40%, 41% to be more precise, last year. So, and this is something that has happened just over the last few years. Um, so, this is something that's going to continue to happen. And then we haven't really, I mean, the PV hasn't, hasn't really you know, taken speed at all in Sweden, but could happen really fast if we had the right incentives. We've had a very insecure political system where we weren't secure with our subsidies. One, from one year to the other, you wouldn't know whether you get the subsidies or not, the extra on top of the certificates subsidies. So that's, we need to create that security for the investors and that's going to, then it's going to be speed. The most serious is that the fossil fuels are not covering the external costs. That's a, a huge uh, subsidy so far. Yes, yes. I thought that that is the truth. scientists in the field going over all the published data against one PhD student. I, in you, can, you can trust who you, you choose to, but, but it seems pretty clear to me. Yeah, in this case, we have just measured the actual cases. The count number of... So there's no causality, there's no, there's no link no between. Variation. So it doesn't, you know, is it a statistical variation? Also, uh, but you can keep, uh, say that nobody has been killed by the nuclear in Japan and just 43 in Chernobyl. No, 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 not 43. We can even, even using the high number, it's, it's I mean, if, if you compare to other energy forms, say hydropower, which is the, the biggest power form in, in Sweden, about half a million people have died in hydropower accidents. We accept hydropower as a great solution to produce our energy, but it's killed half a million people. Coal power kills a million people every year. So even if you say, well, double the highest estimate, say 10,000 people died from Chernobyl, it's still nowhere near, anywhere near per, per unit of energy produced of any of the other major energy sources. Thank you for your answer. Uh, is it only one? Well, uh, all right, just a matter of correction, the biggest source of energy in Sweden is actually bioenergy, produced about 140 terawatt hours last year. So that's much bigger than hydropower and nuclear power together. But that's energy, and not, that's the, not the electricity. That's what heat. No, but it, it made out 8.3% of the electricity as well. But when it comes to the amount of death, yeah, the, the 
of the, the reportings here differ. And we look at the other sources of information, which states hundreds of thousands of deaths, declared ca of, uh, cases of cancer, and the same thing now with Fushima. We will have to wait and see how many people in the end that dies from this. But for sure, like, radioactivity is cancerogenic. Causes cell mutations from, from for people exposed to light. We have radioactivity in this room right now. Okay. We're not getting cancer from it. There's a there's a level where it starts to get dangerous. This is yes. something Which that we have done a lot of research on, so we know it's probably what they have to the ocean. The consequence of the ocean by radiation bomb is that the cancer frequency has increased to about one between one and two percent. Just look at what is happening today with our waste program. 
which Sweden was the first country in the world to hand in the application to build the final waste storage. Now Finland has done it as well. Um, we have the KBS3 method with the copper cancel capsules and the metal clay, etc. And um, there was uh, also some uh, researchers, uh, I don't forget what his name, at the KTH, uh, which has shown that copper capsules can corrode in an oxygen free environment. Now, this has also been uh, this experiment has been re repeated by one of the reviewers, the, the SSM, the regulator, who's also examining the, this 29,000 pages of, of document. So it's very unlikely that this method is gonna is gonna uh, be able to prove, be proved to be the one that we want to use. And then we have uh, wasted 30 billions into that program. And uh, yeah, so just in in. In the whole cost, uh, in the whole discussion of the costs, and then we, we also know that yeah, that's taken up on the energy tax, but we have we know that that's been too little. So so those those three are uh, increased to six if we need to pay for for the big problematic prob uh, program that hasn't solved any problems so far. Um, it's, it's great that they're looking at it, and that people are criticizing the way they're doing it. This is paid for by, by with a special tax that is levied on nuclear power. So it's not some extra tax that we're getting. The, the waste disposal is already paid for by something that we punish the nuclear power plant with. So it's not an extra cost that's this. It's that's on top of the energy tax, but it's way too big. Thanks, Busy. Let's move on to our next question. We have one in the third row here. Yeah. Um, I didn't quite get your comment to the fact that you can't build nuclear in time to save the environment will take too long time. What was your comment about that? So, uh, well, you can say that you can build a windmill in two years, and that you can't build five million windmills in two years. So there's, a, there's production capacity for windmills, and there's production capacity for solar photovoltaic, and there's the production capacity for nuclear. Now, obviously, if you try to build all of them, you will get more builds than if you try to build one of them or two of them. And if you try, as, as our friend here was saying, to get to modular designs where you can factory produce nuclear power plants, then you could get to speed this up a lot. So what we're trying to do right now in the world, or have been, is trying to build as big stations as we can, which take a long time, and then they're built, and they run for a long time and produce a lot. And what we're looking at right now is trying to build smaller ones that you can factory produce, like, in, like an Airbus A380 is, is, is a very big machine that you can factory produce that. You can factory produce a smaller type of nuclear reactor as well, and, and ship a lot, a lot of them. So obviously there are, and there's a lot of research going into this, and there are the nuclear vendors have commercial products that are smaller, and there there is active licensing at least in the U.S. by the NRC right now for the smaller types. So when they start rolling out, you can build them a lot faster. Obviously, if you try to do everything, we could do more, and if we don't shut down the nuclear power plants that we have. Um, we don't have to replace that with something else, so then we can do even more. Okay. We don't have a lot of time, so we'll keep going with questions if there are. Uh, I don't know why I can answer that. Yeah. Just a quick comment to that, that you also please remember that in the US they are subsidizing nuclear power. So the question is of uh, what we have economically viability to build also in time. And since we have this uh, in Sweden that you're not going to subsidize it, and it looks like the UK won't do it either, then it's not going to happen. Unsubsidized nuclear is just too too expensive. If you compare with the alternative, also when it comes to this this uh, fact of, of building up a, an industry around it, that has happened extremely fast in both China but also Germany. Germany they have four hundred thousand jobs within the renewable industry. They are they are calculating that they're going to have seven hundred thousand jobs within that industry just by twenty twenty. In Sweden, all the people, including you, who work with nuclear can can or if you don't work with Sweden can keep their jobs there because you, we still need to close down those reactors but we can create 60,000 new jobs to 2020 just by continuing investing in the renewable energy. I'm not arguing with you on that. I think we should. I just think we should uh, discard some of our options.
those three options this. The mod site management, which is that, and this is what the smart Greeks will do. You will tell, you will cut the peak in the, in the load curve and you will distribute the demand over an extended period of time. This is what they did in Japan after Fukushima when they had closed down 54 reactors temporarily. They managed, the industry were running in shift, people were making sure they had information about when the use of energy was high, when it was low. Some countries like Italy have already a system where they have red, green and yellow and it's, it's coupled to a cost mechanism so that you know when you should use your energy or not. In the future this will be automatic. You will tell your dishwasher that I want my, uh, I want it done tomorrow and it will, it will talk to a little computer in the, in the power grid and distribute the power so that everybody uses it more equally spread. That's one thing. The other thing is storage. You have, you have solar power plants and not small PVs, but power plants in, in, um, in uh, for instance, uh, Spain, running 24-7 with salt uh, storage during the night. So it's completely possible. We have a report called uh, Battle of the Grids, which show how we can do it only with grid extensions. So it's not a problem. The problem is whether we're willing to do this or not, like in time. Um, completely possible. We, all, we have made scenarios, global scenario, uh, regional scenarios, national scenarios for how we can go 100% renewable. Does something like that, you have the scenario, you have the generation for half the scenario. Nothing of this has happened yet. You try, you try to do generation for reactors, and you can try and you have to do the smart grids in Japan. But I mean, is it possible to have the entire world running on smart grids and battery storage? <coughs> It doesn't have to be, the emissions have to peak at 2017, then start to go down. It doesn't have to be 100% removal by 2017, that's impossible. We're looking more, we're, our scenario is heads towards 2050. That's when we have sort of replaced the entire system. And of course it's going gradually. Not even in our scenario we're shutting down all the nuclear power plants tomorrow like this. Because you need to do this slow in a slower process. Well, very optimistic about the renewables. Well, but I don't. Well, I don't. Since the nuclear industry itself is refusing to build all the 50 reactors uh, the UK was talking about, I don't see that it's coming. Well, so uh, we, we UK, don't have the time to not go General forward. Westwick is, is trying to get to build two reactors, and they offered to pay for the reactors themselves. No investment by the UK whatsoever. But there is opposition from groups like Greenpeace and the environmental parties against this which makes it politically hard for them to do this, but General Electric offered to build two generation four reactors and pay for them for them by themselves. There's no investment by the UK whatsoever. And this has been very heavily like, protested. We need to test reactors in your country. That was something else than, than the big consortiums like uh, Verizon. This that is not, a, part this is, this is not a test reactor, it's a commercial design. Uh, it, it has been tested already. Uh, so, it's not really true what you're saying about the future. Yeah, good question. <coughs> well, I was thinking of the Gordon Cancer Chapter again and China. Well, I agree that the green energies are good, but they're also looking for providing for what they need now. And like, okay, it's a, bit, it's a long way to develop green energy, but aren't nuclear power a better alternative than coal? Because like Sweden, we're already cutting down on nuclear, but we're importing energy made from coal from the main plant in Europe. So how do you reply to that? We were also reporting renewable energy from Denmark, which is producing a lot of wind power, which yeah, is going to be hard to do. If we look if you look at China and India, we're, you're going to have huge lock-in effect. If you go and take all the pile of investments and, and start to build nuclear reactors, that and that then will end up like the way that Orbital for three happened. Or the big Yaitapur uh, discussion that's going on in India at the moment, where they're building a reactor on top of a uh, seismic active area where you might have earthquakes all the time. Yeah, it's like what I'm huge saying, problems. What I'm saying is that uh, the bioenergy from the roots is that you don't mention the side effects for the native sites too. Or wind energy in Denmark also has its competitors, mm -hmm. like what you mentioned. I don't say that it's wrong to say it, but you can't. Uh, Forget to mention. The opinion in Europe, 70% wants to invest in renewable power. There's not a lot of opinion. And even if you look at if you look at Sweden, after a while, 
if you look at if you look at um, opinion polls from Bot Plan, for instance, that had it the longest, huge opinion to start with. Now they're proud. Now they really like it because they see the economy in it. Yeah. And also with the value energy, yes, we take that into account. Yeah, we're 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 but are there any others that are greener and... We're not planning to, to replace reactors by in, importing coal. That's not true. But you can export it. Again, the plan is to replace them by 2030. That's that the plan. Possible. Why is it happening then? Why isn't it working? We always have net import, net export. That always happens in the energy system. Yes, but the export, because we, then we have uh, excess capacity in the city for any hour. And also, and we export it in a place fossil fuel. But this, this, uh, this spring, I think we'll, we'll just give some more questions before we finish. There were two here. Is there anyone who hasn't asked a question yet? Who would like to ask a question? No, I would like to hear the nuclear side what they have to say about the current demand for energy. Like they say, it's not reliable to have. I don't know what you think. But what, what, what do you say? Is the fourth generation is it reliable for the nearest future? The, the fourth generation uh, is being built and has been built. It's not a futuristic, you know, 100 years from now it might happen. We've built, if you're, if you're looking at different technologies that we want to build in fourth generation, they're cooled by different uh, things than water. And these have been built in Russia. There, there is one operating very successfully commercially in Russia since the 1980s. Okay. This, is, uh, this is a political will and, and a lot of opposition from environmental groups that maybe has anchored this a little bit, but there is the, the, the nuclear uh, speed of development in India and China will definitely see, and Russia, will definitely see a bunch of, a lot of generation four years coming up. So I think you have a very sober view of, of uh, the state uh, as when we shut down Russia back, for instance, we imported Danish coal power. And this will, you know, this That's is what we have. And backlash is about the fourth generation. You were, from, from scientific point of view, uh, Research, even in, in the 60s, but it has been a lot of backlashes. But of course, it's solvable today to, to a very large extent. And, and then we're using the uranium about 100 times better. Well, like, yeah. Why is there so much arguing within national borders if we have this possibility to balance 40 terawatts of wind power with uh, Sweden's hydropower? We also have the huge hydropower in Norway. Uh, this should, of course, balance wind power in Denmark and Holland and Northern Germany and Poland and so on. Since we are a connected system and it can be even more interconnected. And now we have the balancing of wind power in Germany by natural gas turbines burning Russian gas. And if, and if we think only about Sweden here, and say that we will use this for 40 terawatt hour of capacity within Sweden only, it stops at the border. Then we can help Denmark or Germany and we'll get a sub-optimal uh, energy system that won't help the environment as much and won't help the economy much, as much. And why stop at the border? That's not at all what we think. That's what we produced this report, Battle of the Grids, for instance. So, but just as an example of how much, for, like what kind of numbers just the existing hydropower could balance, that's the numbers. But then, of course, it will be balanced in many different ways. It will not be bad. We will definitely not close the borders. We're but looking it's even more important to get rid of nuclear power in Sweden. Okay, excuse me. Yeah, I just uh, have to add that both Denmark and, uh, and Germany has uh, tougher goals than Sweden when it comes to renewable energy, when it comes to emission re uh, reduction. Uh, so tackling the, the, the climate crisis is, is a question of like setting, uh, like putting uh, good targets. It's, a, it's about doing. Yeah, and, and both both Germany and, and Denmark is, is doing that. Well, we right, have in a, in, a, in a system where we have huge amount of renewable capacity, 
on the grid and they have uh, priority access to the grid, you have a problem with base load. It doesn't matter if it's coal power, if it's nuclear power, but then you have a situation where the, all the renewable uh, intermittent power is cutting down into the base load, which means that and since you can't shut off, to, or you can, but it, it, that's not the way they're constructed to work, neither coal or nuclear power plants, they cannot coexist in a system with high share of renewable energy. And we need a high share of renewable energy in order to be able to uh, get down the emissions in time, which means that we have to shut down nuclear power and we have to shut down coal power plants. From an intermittent perspective.